All right, how you doing, everyone? We are going to start out with a little bit of pre-cal review, kind of focus on some graphing things that you need to remember. Um, and we'll move on to some solving some e equations and inequalities towards the end. All right, so rational functions are going to be a big part of calculus and just kind of knowing how to make a sketch of these and what they look like. Um, anytime you're dealing with a rational function like this, especially if you have some sort of polynomial on the top or bottom, um, like a quadratic, it's always a good idea to factor. So let's start there. Um, this top can factor into x minus 3 times x plus 2. And then we have our x minus 3 on the bottom. All right. And the reason that's a good idea is because if you do get a common factor like this, which cancels out, uh, you want to go ahead and do that. And then that'll make whatever we're dealing with a little bit easier to handle. So this uh, function simplifies down to just x plus 2. Uh, which is a linear function, and we could just kind of go on and graph that right now, but we do want to fill all this stuff out, so uh, we're going to do that first. All right, so um, they want us to find the x-intercept. So anytime you need to find an x-intercept, you're going to set your y equal to zero. So notice we have y equals the function, so that means we would do zero equals, and then we're going to use the simplified form of our function over here, so x plus 2. Uh, that gives us a solution of x equals negative 2 when we move the 2 over. And so our x-intercept in point form would be negative 2 comma 0. We know the y-coordinate is 0 because that's what we set y equal to to find that value. All right, uh, y-intercept, similar concept, except you set x equal to 0. So now we're going to take our function here, y equals x plus 2, and we're going to plug in 0 for x. So y equals 0 plus 2 which means y is equal to 2. So the coordinates for that are 0, comma 2, 0 for the x because we set x equal to 0 to find that. All right, um, domain. So if we were just looking at a linear function, um, the domain would be all real numbers. So if I were to graph this, I would plot my x and y intercept, draw a line through it, that would be our graph. But we aren't just looking at a linear function, we're looking at this original function. So anytime you are doing domain, there's really two main things you have to worry about. There's uh, maybe three if we include logs. But basically, you need to avoid a zero in the denominator. You need to avoid a negative number inside a square root. And you need to avoid a negative number or the number zero inside a log. So those are your three big ones that you always want to be thinking about in any math problem you're working on. So this problem, we did have a denominator. Even though we canceled it out, we still have to consider that that denominator was there in the original problem. And so we're not allowed to let that denominator be zero. So we would have to say that x minus 3, let me switch up my color here, x minus 3 cannot be equal to zero. Uh, and what that means is that x cannot equal positive 3. If you plugged in positive 3 right there, you would get zero, and that's not allowed. So that is our domain. This is kind of the concise way to write your domain. Uh, you could say like all real numbers except for three. Um, and then there's like a fancy set notation, but this is good enough for me. That's all I'm really concerned with. All right, and now the range. Um, again, for a normal linear function, the range would also be all real numbers. But since we x is not allowed to be three, that's going to correspond to a y value that uh, it's not allowed to be either. And so we're going to find that by uh, plugging this 3 into our simplified equation. So y cannot be equal to 3 plus 2, which means y cannot be equal to 5. All right, and so what that corresponds to, those two numbers right there, is a point on the graph, 3 comma 5. And so you might be wondering, well, what does that look like if that's not there? This is a line. It's a linear function, uh, and it's not allowed to be equal to this point. And so you learned this back in Algebra 2. You did it again last year in pre-cal. Uh, that is a hole in the graph. So our graph is going to have a hole at 3, 5. And that's where that domain and range comes from there. So now let's make a sketch. We have our x-intercept at negative 2, 0 right there. We have our y-intercept at 0, 2 right there, and then we'll go ahead and plot this hole as well at 3, 5, and a hole is going to be an open circle like that. All right, draw your line through those points, and we're done. 
All right, problem number two. So we have a square root here. Um, nothing to factor or simplify this time, so we can just attack all of our questions here right away. Uh, remember that y, x intercept is where y is equal to zero. So that would be zero equals the square root of x plus three. Square both sides, uh, and you would get zero is equal to x plus three. And then subtract the three, and you get x is equal to negative three. So that's going to correspond to negative three comma zero. All right, y-intercept is where x is equal to zero. So y is equal to the square root of zero plus three. And that's going to simplify to y is equal to the square root of three. So that would be zero comma the square root of three. All right, um, let's save domain and range for a second. Let's go over here. So negative three zero is here. Uh, 0 square root of 3, so square root of 4 is 2, so square root of 3 is a little bit less than 2, so somewhere right about there. Uh, you might remember what a square root graph looks like, but let's pretend like we don't, and let's plug in a couple numbers for x just to get other values. So you want to plug in numbers that'll give you something nice, a perfect square, for instance, so we could take the square root. So like negative 2, that'd be a good number, because negative 2 plus 3 is 1, and the square root of one is one. So negative two, one is a point. Uh, positive one would be a good number because one plus three is four and the square root of four is two. And then the next good number would be probably like six. Six plus three is nine and the square root of nine is three. Three, four, five, six. And that's gonna correspond to three. So this is what your square root graph looks like. And it goes like that. All right, I mentioned this on the last problem um, in regards to domain. So whenever you're dealing with a square root function, um, you are not allowed to have any negative numbers inside your square root. So that's why this graph stops right here at negative three. So if I tried to plug in negative four or even negative 3.1, I would get a negative number inside. So our domain for this is x is greater than or equal to negative three. Another way to write that would be from negative three to infinity. That's interval notation. The negative three gets a square bracket because it is included. That's why I got the equal sign here. Uh, if you did not want to include that, you would put a parentheses. All right, and so the range is gonna correspond to the domain. So um, with this graph, since it's uh, sitting here at zero, it only goes up, it only goes positive from its starting point. So uh, y is gonna be greater than or equal to zero zero to infinity. All right, let's try another one. Another square root here. This one's a little bit different though. Uh, we can start the same way that we did the other problems though. For x-intercept, we want to set y equal to zero. So zero is equal to the square root of 25 minus x squared. So we square both sides to get rid of our square root. Zero is equal to 25 minus x squared. Uh, then I'm going to add the x squared over this side. So I'll get positive x squared is equal to 25. And then we're going to square root both sides. So I get x is equal to 5. But you have to remember when you're solving this equation and you take a square root on both sides, you always put a plus or minus in front. So we actually have two x-intercepts on this problem. We have positive 5, comma, 0, and we also have negative five comma zero. All right, y-intercept, set your x equal to zero. So we would get y is equal to the square root of 25 minus zero squared, zero. So y is equal to five. The square root of 25 is five. And um, this one, unlike the last problem, we were not taking the square root of both sides on this one. Um, the square root was already there. And when it's already there, they have told you what sign it is. They, it's a positive. If there's no sign in front, that means it's a positive square root. If there is a sign in front, it'd be a negative sign, and it'd be a negative square root. So unlike the last one where we put the square root there ourselves because we had to do that as part of our algebra, this one already had it there. So this does not have a plus or minus is what I'm trying to get at here. This only has one solution, one y-intercept. In fact, a function cannot have 
more than one y-intercept because then it would fail the vertical line test and it would no longer be a function. So you are allowed to have multiple x-intercepts. You are never allowed to have multiple y-intercepts if you're dealing with a function. All right, let's go over and graph this and see what we can come up with here. So one, two, three, four, five. Here's an x-intercept, and then another way, one, two, four, five. There's an x-intercept, and then one, two, three, four, five. There's our y-intercept. All right, so the last problem I suggest is like plugging in some numbers, and that's not a bad idea here as well. Um, however, the numbers you would plug in, um, well, we, we have we have a couple that we can plug in and get a nice value, I think. Maybe, maybe more than one. All right, let's try and plug in. I'll start on the positive side just so we don't have to worry about the negatives for a minute. So let's try plugging in positive four. So that would be y is equal to the 25 minus four squared. All right, well, four squared is 16. So that's 25 minus 16. Uh, and I believe that's nine. And that works out pretty nicely because that's three. So four, three is the point. All right, and I think with the same kind of logic, we can use the number three. Uh, that would be y is equal to the square root of 25 minus three squared, which is 25 minus nine, uh, which is 16, and the square root of 16 is four. So three, four. So it kind of looks like it's gonna go up like that. And then if you think about what the squared does, if I plugged in the negative version of those numbers, like negative four and negative three, I would, when I square it, I would still get positive 16 and positive nine. And it will work out the exact same way. So negative four, positive three, negative three, positive four. So it's kind of, looks like it's making a circle. And in fact, it is making a circle. Uh, this is a semicircle because we don't have the bottom part. If we had the bottom part, it would no longer be a function. So this is the function version of a circle. This one's good to memorize. I'm going to write it up here. Memorize what this formula looks like of a semicircle. It's the square root of r squared minus x squared. And if we had a negative in front, it would be reflected down. It would be the negative part of the circle instead. So you're going to have either, you could have either one, you just don't have both. If we had both, it'd be a plus or minus. That would be the whole circle, and it wouldn't be a function. Now I'm going to show you one more thing here, then we'll talk about domain and range. So let's, uh, let's rewrite this equation another way. Come over here. So similar to how I solved for the x-intercept here, except I'm not going to plug in zero. I'm just going to leave it as y. So we're going to start by squaring both sides. So that would give me y squared is equal to 25 minus x squared. Then I'm going to move the x squared over. That'd be x squared plus y squared is equal to 25. And this is the formula for a circle that you learned all the way back in geometry for the first time, and you did it again in, in pre-cal probably was the next time you saw it. Um, the formula for a circle is actually x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. So r is the radius. If this is r squared, then the r is 5. And h and k are the center. And so if there are no h and k, like in our equation, then that means the center is at 0, 0. And you can see the radius is 5, and radius going up is 5. r equals 5. r equals 5. If you went out to one of these points right here, like that one, you could drop it down, and that makes a right triangle. This is a length of three. This is a length of four. It is a three, four, five right triangle. Same thing here it would be four, three, five. So there's a little bit of geometry for you. All right, let's look at domain and range. Um, the range, the domain is all the x values. So. If we, if we look at this graphically, which is a lot easier on this one, just look at it graphically. Um, so that's why it's not just important to memorize what this is. It's a semicircle, so you can draw it out real quick, and then you can easily see the domain. The domain goes from left to right on the graph. So this goes from negative 5 
to positive 5. And the negative 5 and the positive 5 are included, so they get those equal signs. You could also write it in interval notation like this, with the square brackets on both. All right, and then the range goes from bottom to top. So we're starting at 0, the y value there is 0, and then the top is positive 5. So 0, less than or equal to y, less than or equal to 5, or 0 to 5. All right, moving along. All right, this is a, a very fancy function. You probably haven't seen this one before, so there's a little bit of new stuff here. Um, we'll be doing the same thing we've been doing. Um, this has a lot of interesting properties when it comes to limits, which is going to be our first big calculus topic we talk about. Um, this has a name. It's called the signum function. You don't need to know that name. I just like telling you what it is. Um, and signum is anytime you have an absolute value of something divided by that same something. So this is absolute value of x divided by x. It could be absolute value of x plus 2 divided by x plus 2, as long as whatever is inside the absolute value you're being divided by. Uh, you could also flip those and put the absolute value on the bottom and the non-absolute value part on top, and it would work the same way. All right, and so this one, I think it's just best to make a table. So we're going to make a table of some values. And hopefully you kind of recognize there's one value that uh, we can't have zero. So I'm going to come down and do domain first. Remember with rational functions, you're not allowed to have a zero in the denominator, so x cannot be equal to zero. All right, so it's important to kind of establish that first. And then when you're making your table, you want to do a couple numbers to the left of this number and a couple numbers to the right. And this number won't always be zero. It could be any, any real number. Um, so a couple numbers to the left would be like negative two and negative one. And a couple numbers to the right would be positive 1 and positive 2. All right, so we're just going to plug these in. So I'm going to plug in um, negative 2. The absolute value turns it into a positive 2. And it's 3 times 2. So that would be a 6 on top divided by a 2 on bottom. And so we get 3. Uh, if I plug in, oh, sorry, it's negative 2 on bottom. Yeah, positive 2 because uh, of the absolute value, but negative 2 on bottom. So it would be a negative 3. Let me write that a little bit better. Okay. Uh, if I plug in negative 1, I get a positive 1 times 3 is 3 divided by negative 1. So that's going to be also negative 3. All right, if I plug in positive 1, uh, it's going to stay positive. So 3 times 1 is 3, and then I'm dividing by positive 1. And so that's positive 3. And then 3 times 2 would be 6 divided by 2, and that would be positive 3. All right, and that pattern stays the same. So if I went to negative 3, it would be negative 9, or sorry, it would be positive 9 divided by negative 3, which would be negative 3. So all the numbers to the left of 0 equal negative 3, and all the numbers to the right of 0 equal positive 3. So what that ends up looking like is we're going to go 1, 2, 3, there's positive 3, and then 1, 2, 3, there's negative 3. Um, and then we'll start with the left, so negative 1, negative 2, so we got negative 3, we can put a point there. We got negative 3, we can put a point there. If we want to go another one, we can put a point there. You can kind of see what's happening. It's, it's making a horizontal line. So it can't be equal to 0. So I'm going to put an open circle there at 0. And then we're going to go to the left like that. All right, and then to the right, uh, same idea. If positive 1 is positive 3. Positive 2, positive 3. Positive 3 would be positive 3 and so on. So we'll put an open circle here at zero because it cannot be equal to zero. And we'll go to the right like that. All right, so uh, if you look at your x-intercepts, looking at this graph, this is another graph that's helpful to just kind of memorize what it looks like. Anytime you see something in this form, you know it's going to be two horizontal lines. Now the, the open circles could shift left or right. Uh, the y values can be different. Uh, the reason they're three is because of this three in front right here. If that was a 2 instead, then they would have been at 2. And if that's a 1, or if there's nothing there, which means it's a 1, then it'd be 1 and 1, 1 and negative 1. So those are things that can be a little bit different. And like I mentioned, if you had absolute value of x plus 2 over x plus 2 like that, then x would not be allowed to be equal to negative 2. So this these open circles would be shifted over to negative 2 like that. All right, so those are things that are a little different, but... All of the graphs that are in this form have the same property, where they have horizontal lines going to the left and the right. 
and open circles on that domain spot. So what you can see from that is that there are no x-intercepts. This graph does not cross the x-axis. There are also no y-intercepts. Now, if the graph is shifted, then there might be a y-intercept. This, this line could cross, or if it shifted right, then this line would cross. But when our domain is at zero, like that x cannot equal zero, then it is not going to have a y-intercept either. All right, so our domain is all real numbers except for zero. You can see it touching every x value going to the left and every x value going to the right. Um, our range is, how, however, a little bit different. So y is equal to, and there's actually only two numbers in the range, positive 3 and negative 3. So if you ever want to just list out a couple values for a domain or range, the easiest way is to put a brace and list those numbers out like that and then close it with a brace. All right, let's try a piecewise function. All right, this one just says to sketch the graph. We're not going to use a calculator. It doesn't ask us to find all the other stuff. Um, so we won't worry about that on this one. Piecewise functions are a big deal in calculus because they are a way for test makers to um, get some values that do not exist. Uh, do, do, does not exist is a big concept with limits. And then since limits define our other two concepts, derivatives and integrals, they they involve piecewise functions a lot. So you need to get comfortable with being able to sketch out a graph of a piecewise function by hand, because you'll see these pop up on non-calculator parts of, of our tests and of the AP exam as well. All right, so when x is less than zero, so that's to the left of zero on the graph here, uh, we have this, this parabola, x squared minus one. So um, I would just start by plugging in zero right there. Zero minus one is negative one. And um, x is equal to zero there, so we can put a closed circle at zero, negative one. And then just plot a couple points going to the left. Doesn't have to be very many until you're confident that you know what the graph looks like. So if I plug in negative one, negative one squared is one, minus one is zero. So negative one, zero. If I plug in negative two, negative two squared is four, four minus one is three. All right, and then um, negative 3 squared is 9. 9 minus 1 is 8. So let's see if I can fit that on there. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we know what a parabola looks like. So you can kind of draw a parabola shape. It's kind of a wonky one, but I'm drawing it by hand, so it's fine. All right, and then x is greater than 0 is going to the right. So now we're starting at 0 again, but we're going to the right this time. Um, I'm still going to start by plugging in 0 for x. That's going to 0 out that x term. And 0 minus 2 is negative 2. But see how this one, it is not equal to. In fact, a piecewise function cannot be equal on both of them, because if it was, we'd put a closed circle there as well, and then it would not pass the vertical line test. It wouldn't be a function. Um, so this one's not equal to, so we need an open circle there. And then you kind of go with the same strategy if you'd like, or... You could recognize that this is a linear function, and therefore it has a slope of one third, and you can do rise over run, up one over three. Up one over three. And then we're drawing that in to the right like that. Hey, I prefer that method with a linear function because uh, if you try to plug in like one, you're gonna get one third minus two, and then you're doing arithmetic in your head with fractions and that's always a scary proposition, so uh, just use the rise of a run with the slope, and you'll be in good shape on those linear functions. All right, one more graph. Um, this time we're going to find all the asymptotes, which we haven't been asked to do yet because we haven't had one that had any asymptotes yet. Um, we're going to be asked to find the symmetry, and then the x and y intercepts, and we're going to sketch the graph, all of this without a calculator. All right, so it shouldn't be too bad. We have another rational function here. Um, I mentioned this on the first graph, that um, first problem that we should try to factor if we have um, some polynomials on the top or the bottom. And so um, we don't have a factorable polynomial on the top, so we'll just leave that as it is. And uh, we will factor this bottom into x plus 2 and x minus 2. All right, nothing is going to cancel out here, so... Um, that, we'll just leave it like this. But this is still helpful um, in finding one of our 
uh, sets of asymptotes. All right, so we're starting with a horizontal asymptote. So there are three rules. You can either be top heavy, you can be bottom heavy, or you can be balanced. And we're going to be hitting these three very hard in one of our limit lessons um, in this uh, first unit once we start doing limits. Uh, so you'll definitely need to know about your top heavy, bottom heavy, and balanced rules very well. So if you're top heavy, then that means you have no horizontal asymptote. Uh, if you're bottom heavy, that means uh, you have y equals zero. It's automatically zero every time. And then if you're balanced, you have y equals a over b. Uh, that's where you divide the coefficients in your problem. So what we're looking at here is the exponents. Are the exponents top heavy, bottom heavy, or balanced? So I go to my, I don't want to look at my factored form for this. So I want to look at my original problem. So if I look at my exponents, I have a 2 and a 2. So that's the same. So when they're the same, that means it's balanced. Bottom heavy means the one on the bottom is bigger. Top heavy means the one on the top is bigger. All right, so when they're balanced, you divide the coefficients in front. Three divided by one. So that is our horizontal asymptote. Y equals three. All right, vertical asymptotes, a little more straightforward. You are not allowed to have a zero in the denominator. On that first problem, when we encountered that, the denominator have been canceled out. So that created a hole in the graph. But if the denominator does not cancel out, if it's still there, then that's going to create a vertical asymptote in your graph instead. So we're actually going to have two vertical asymptotes because we have this these two factors. So we're going to set x plus 2 equal to 0. And we get x equals negative 2. And then we're going to do the same thing with our other factor, x minus 2 equal to 0. And so we get x equals positive 2. All right, slant asymptotes uh, kind of go with the, the top heavy, bottom heavy balanced. Um, and these only occur when you have a top heavy graph. So if we had a top heavy graph, we would be finding a slant asymptote. Since we do not have a top heavy graph, we will not have a slant asymptote. All right, um, our y-intercept comes from when y is equal to zero. So um, we do zero equals three x squared over, uh, you can use either form here. I'm just gonna use x squared minus four. All right, a fraction is equal to zero when the numerator is equal to zero. Okay, the only thing you have to make sure of is, is um, make sure your denominator will not also be equal to zero, but we can check that at the end. So we're gonna take that numerator by itself and set that equal to zero. And that's something we can pretty easily solve. Divide by three on both sides take the square root. And normally we would have to put a plus or minus when we take the square root like that. But since our answer is zero, zero doesn't have a positive or a negative. It's just zero. So that's our answer. Our x-intercept is zero, zero. All right, our y-intercept comes from x being equal to zero. So you get, um, they used f of x up here, but that's the same thing as y, so I'm going to switch it to y. So you get 3 times 0 squared over 0 squared minus 4. And we get 0 on top, negative 4 on bottom, so we get 0. Definitely makes sense because we got 0, 0 as our um, x-intercept, so it, that has to also be the y-intercept. It has to be the same. Okay, so we have a lot of info here. We should be able to graph this. So 0, 0 is the only point we found, uh, but we have found a horizontal asymptote at y equals 3. So this is our horizontal asymptote. We have two vertical asymptotes, one at x equals 2. And one at x equals negative 2. And all right, those are all the things we found. So we will need to figure out something else in here uh, to help us graph this. Um, if we go back to Algebra 2, y'all learned how to do RATEY, R-A-T-E-Y. That was to help you find the roots, which we did here. X-intercepts are roots. 
the asymptotes, the um, togetherness, which we haven't talked about here. I'll do that in a minute. Um, the end behavior, end behavior is the horizontal asymptote, and then um, the y-intercept, which we found here. All right, once you did that, um, this, this y-intercept tells you that there's a curve in the middle here. And so our curve is going to follow along this asymptote. It's going to hit that y-intercept, and it's going to curve back down. It can't go up because it's going to hit this asymptote up here. Um, and it can't go past either one of these vertical asymptotes. So that's pretty much the only shape it can take. If you're not confident in that, you can always just plug a number in like 1, and you would get 3 over 1 minus 4, which is negative 3. 3 over negative 3 is negative 1. So 1 would be negative 1 right there. Same thing if you plugged in negative 1 because the squares would turn the negative 1 into positive 1. So you get that there. And you could do uh, another point if you like as well, but I think that gets you to where you want to be. The T in um, Rady was for togetherness. So you only have togetherness is if on the denominator you have squares factors that are perfect squares. So like if this had been x plus 2 squared like that, that would have um, created togetherness at that asymptote. Togetherness happens at the vertical asymptotes only. Um, so neither of these are perfect squares. So there's no togetherness. Togetherness means that the curve is right next to, they're next to each other together. So if there's not togetherness, which there's not in these because there's no perfect squares, then the, our other curves have to go up here. And we don't really need to be too fine about where they are. You don't need to plot a bunch of points. Just kind of have the idea of where they are, and you're good to go. Now, there's one other thing mentioned here in my um, slot for where it got moved to the other page. If you kind of look on your next page, you'll see symmetry there. Um, but I want to do it on this page. So I'm going to write it over here. Now, if you just look at this graph, you may notice that it has symmetry. Symmetry is where things are on the same on the left and the right side. Okay, and so at the y-axis, everything on the left side is the exact same. If we reflected it, if we like folded the graph over at the y-axis, they would be right on top of each other. Save the, we drew it by hand, so uh, we may be a little off. But if we graph this on a calculator, it would be exactly. Okay, so how do we prove that it has y-axis symmetry? Um, you actually want to prove if it's an even function or an odd function. Okay, so even functions... have y-axis symmetry. And odd functions have origin symmetry. So we can visually see that we have an even function, so that's what we're going for. Um, but the way to prove an even function or an odd function is the same process to start with. It's just the result you get at the end will tell you whether it's an even function or an odd function. It could, could be neither. Not all functions are e even and odd. So actually, most functions would, would not be either one. All right, so here's how you do that. Um, kind of ran out of room here. I'll, I'll fit it in down here, though. All right, you plug in negative x into f. So you're doing f of negative x. So that looks like this. Uh, you have your 3, and then you're plugging in negative x for x squared. And then on the bottom, you, you're plugging in negative x squared, and then you have your minus 4. All right, then you want to simplify. So if you square a negative, you get a positive. So that's going to turn back into positive x squared. And same thing down here is going to turn into positive x squared. And uh, you'll notice that we got back exactly what we started with. So this is equal to f of x. So when you have f of negative x is equal to f of x, that is an even function. f of negative x is equal to f of x. Odd functions, f of negative x will be equal to negative f of x. So you'll get back the same function, but with a negative. So if we've gotten like negative 3x squared over x squared minus 4, that would have been an odd function. We'll encounter some of those a little later in the course. All right, graphing part is over. No, I lied to you. Graphing part is not over. Okay, we got a few inequalities down here. So, okay, so one more graphing. Same deal, we have a, a rational function 
x squared plus 2x and x minus 1. And so we want to start out by trying to factor. So we're going to do that. So this is going to factor. We can take out an x up here. So x times x plus 2. And then we can uh, not do anything with this down here. Leave it as x minus 1. OK, so uh, nothing cancels out. So that's good. Um, now we go to our horizontal asymptote. So we're looking at top heavy, bottom heavy, or balanced. Uh, this one is top heavy. Uh, and remember from the last example, that means that we have no horizontal asymptote. What that actually means is we have a slant asymptote. So we'll get to practice that here in a second. Let's go to our vertical asymptote first, though. All right, we set our denominator equal to 0. And so we get x equals 1, and that is our vertical asymptote. OK, how do we do a slant asymptote? So anytime you have a slant asymptote, anytime it's top heavy, you have to do division. All right, I'm going to show you two different ways to do this. I'm going to I'm going to come up here, and we're going to go back to the original form. All right, so division. If I can spell, there we go. Okay, so you can do just regular long division, uh, which works just fine here. So you take your denominator, that's your divisor. And you divide that into x squared plus 2x. And anytime you're missing a term, so we're missing the last term, that constant, you want to put a plus 0. It's not quite as important um, when it's the last term. Uh, still important, you still want to remember to do it. But if you forgot, you can kind of figure out that you forgot. Where it's really important, though, is if you're missing a term in the middle. So if it was just x squared plus 2, you'd be missing that x term in the middle. Then you've got to make sure to put a 0x in the middle there. All right, you'll see why in a second. OK, so now um, we have to figure out what multiplies by x to equal x squared. Well, x times x is equal to x squared. So we're going to put an x up there. This is our quotient. And um, then we're distributing that x to both terms here. So x times x is x squared. And x times negative 1 is negative x. And then remember when you did division um, in elementary school with regular numbers, you would always subtract this from what's above it. So we're going to put a minus, and that turns that into a plus. So the first term should always cancel out when you do this. And then you just combine the two terms here. And then we want to bring down our next term. All right, let's do the process again. What multiplies by x to equal 3x? Well, 3 times x would be 3x. And then we multiply 3 times x is 3x. Three, 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. And then we're subtracting this from what's above it, so minus and plus. And then our first terms cancel out. 0 plus 3 is 3. 3 is your remainder. Okay, and if we were doing just regular division, you would do plus 3 over x minus 1. But for a slant asymptote, you do not care about that remainder. All you care about is the um, quotient without the remainder. So that is our slant asymptote right there. It's a y equals, just like the horizontal asymptotes are y equals. It's y equals, and then it's x plus 3. All right, and so that's a linear function. It's going to be a slanted line, which is why it's called a slant asymptote. All right, um, as I told you, there were two ways. So this is the other way. Since your denominator is a linear function and it has no coefficient or it has a coefficient of one, I should say, um, those are the rules for when you can properly use synthetic division. So I write mine maybe a little differently than some textbooks do. This is how I learned how to do it. I put a little box and whatever number makes the denominator zero goes in that box. So positive one would make the denominator zero. So we put a one there and then all the coefficients of your numerator go next to this box, um, including the zero at the end. You can see why that was important because we had to have a term to line up with this plus three to get our remainder. Same thing's going to be true over here. So coefficient of one for the x squared, coefficient of two for the two x, and coefficient of zero uh, for the last term, or constant of zero for the last term. Leave a little space in between and draw a line. And then you're always going to bring down that first number then whatever numbers are below the line, multiply by whatever's in the box. So 1 times 1 is 1. Then you add these together, 3. 3 times 1 is 3. 0 plus 3 is 3. That last number is your remainder. 
And then um, you know what to start with here because x squared divided by x is x. So that would be x plus 3 and then plus 3 over the remainder. And you can see we get the same answer. Synthetic is a little faster and easier, but it is um, more restrictive because you have to have that specific version of a denominator. But if you have that, I would recommend using synthetic division. We will be seeing that show up later in the course as well. All right, let's find our x and y intercepts and then get to graphing this thing. All right, so we're going to set y equal to 0. So we get 0 equals x squared plus 2x over x minus 1. Uh, remember that um, we can't have uh, any time a fraction is equal to 0, then that means the numerator has to be equal to 0. And I probably should have just gone ahead and use the factored form x times x plus 2 is equal to 0. So we actually get two x-intercepts. We get x is equal to 0, and we get x plus 2 is equal to 0, which means that x is equal to negative 2. So we have negative 2, comma, 0, and 0, 0. Right, and for the y-intercept, we get um, x is equal to 0. So we get y equals 0, plus 0 over 0 minus 1. And 0 over negative 1 is 0. So we get 0, 0 for that. Makes sense because 0, 0 is also an x-intercept. All right, we'll tackle symmetry in just a second. Um, let's plot what we know. So we know 0, 0 is a point. We know negative 2, 0 is a point. We know x equals 1 is a vertical asymptote. And we know y equals x plus 3, y-intercept of 3, slope of 1, rise over run, rise over run. And I can go down and left as well. So this is our slant asymptote here. It would hit right there at negative 3. All right, so one of our curves has to be in this section right here, because that's where our two x-intercepts are. So you kind of follow that slant asymptote, go here, and at some point it's going to curve down and kind of go like that. Again, we're not being super perfect here. This is fine. We talked about togetherness. If this denominator had been x minus 1 squared, then it would have togetherness, and our other curve would go right next to it, right there. But it didn't have a squared. It's a regular linear factor. So no togetherness, our other curve has to go up here in this section like that. Just a reminder, we cannot go above our curve because then it would not pass the vertical line test. We would no longer have a function. All right, so we talked about even and odd last time. Um, this is certainly not symmetrical over the y-axis. If I folded this graph over the y-axis, they would not match up with each other at all. So it's not going to be an even function. Um, origin symmetry, um, basically, if you fold it over the x-axis and then fold it over the y-axis, that's when they should match up. Um, and this doesn't look like that's going to be the case either. I don't think this has any symmetry at all, um, at least not the two that we are concerned with. But we can verify this uh, pretty easily by doing that f of negative x calculation. So we get negative x squared minus 2 times negative x over negative x minus 1. So that's going to be positive x squared because the squared makes the negative a positive, And the negative times the negative is going to be 2x over negative x minus 1. Um, and that's, that's nothing. That does not equal f of x. It's not the original. And it also does not equal f, uh, negative f of x. So there's no symmetry. All right, negative f of x. Um, you could have two different options here. Um, it, it could be a, a negative on top. So it could have been negative x squared minus 2x over x minus 1. And that's not what we got. Or that negative could have gone on the bottom instead. And so that would be x squared plus 2x over negative x plus 1. 
who you have to distribute. Uh, and that's not what we got either. So it's neither one of those, therefore no symmetry. All right, last part of this first day of pre-cal review is um, solving some inequalities um, with polynomials. Okay, this has um, a method that you use to find the final answer that we will use all the time when we get to derivatives. Once we have learned derivatives, we use them to determine a graph's concavity. We use them to determine when a graph is increasing and decreasing, when it has a maximum and a minimum, a bunch of stuff we get to do with those. And they all use the same method to figure all that stuff out. And it involves drawing a number line. So that's why we are going over this again here. All right, so anytime you wanna solve a polynomial um, equation or inequality, you're most likely going to be factoring. Um, so that's what we're going to do here. This one's got a little bit harder of a factoring job. And uh, we're going to pretend this is equal to zero for a minute. And then we'll go back and, and figure out the uh, inequality at the end. Okay, so with a 15, um, I need two numbers that multiply to 15. So it could be one and 15, could be five and three. Okay, if you don't know what it is off the top of your head, which these, these are a little tougher, harder to do with your head, um, I would always default to the numbers that are closer together, so 5 and 3. And if you can't find anything that works there, then try the 1 and the 15. Um, it just takes some, some practice and doing it as much as possible, and you'll get the hang of it. You'll start to see the patterns over and over again. All right, I know the other two numbers have to be a 1 and a 2 because those are the only two numbers that multiply to 2. So that makes our life a little bit easier. Um, also know they have to be a plus and a minus, or a minus and a plus, opposite signs, because um, if you multiply a negative times a negative, you get a positive, too. And if I multiply a positive times a positive, I also get a positive, too. So a positive times a negative is the only way to get a negative, too. All right, and so I'm just going to, if I put the two here, that'd be 6. 2 times 3 would be 6, and 1 times 5 would be 5. Uh, 6 minus 5 would be 1. And I want to get a 7 in the middle. So then I'm going to put the 2 here and the 1 here. 2 times 5 is 10. 1 times 3 is 3. 10 minus 3 is 7. That's good. I want it to be a negative 7, so I want the bigger number to be negative. Negative 2 times 5 is negative 10. Positive 1 times 3 is 3. And negative 10 plus 3 is negative 7. So there's our factoring. Then we set our factors equal to 0. And we get x equals negative one-fifth, and we get x equals two-thirds, and two divided by three. All right, we're not done yet. This is where our number line comes in. We actually have to find out where this function is greater than zero. So we're going to put this on a number line. Make sure you put them in the right order. Negative one-fifth on the left, positive two-thirds on the right. And you're not going to do anything with those numbers, thankfully, because those are kind of ugly. It would be hard to deal with. Uh, you're going to pick numbers in between them, one in the left section, one in the middle, one on the right. So the middle one, I would definitely recommend choosing zero. That's usually the easiest number to use. Um, and zero falls right in between a negative and a positive. All right, to the right of two thirds, I think I might choose one. And to the left of negative one fifth, I think I'll probably choose negative one. You can choose any number that falls in that section, but you want to try to use the easiest numbers possible because you're plugging this in and you're doing it by hand. No calculator, it says up here. All right, so we're going to start on the left side. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug them into the factored form because it's the exact same thing as this up here, but it's easier to deal with. So if I plug in negative 1, I would get negative 5 plus 1. That, that would be a negative. I don't really care what the number is. I care what the sign is. If I plug in negative 1 over here, I would get negative 3 minus 2 negative 5. So that's also a negative. And so what's important here is these two factors are being multiplied together. So that would be a negative times a negative. So every number in that section is going to give you a positive number. All right, if I plug in 0, 0 plus 1 is a positive. 0 minus 2 is a negative. Positive times a negative is a negative. Every number in there will be a negative. If I plug in positive 1, I get 5 plus 1, which is a positive, I get 3 minus 2, which is a positive. Positive times a positive is a positive. Okay, if your polynomials are normal, um, they don't have any like squares on their factors or anything like that, then your signs should always alternate. So that's something you can kind of expect. But there are weird ones that pop up. We'll see one in our notes here in a bit um, that do not alternate. So you just have to watch out for some of those weird things that happen. Um, one more thing to consider is that this was greater than 0, not equal to. So we should put open circles there. 
And if we want greater than zero, we want the positives. Positive numbers are greater than zero, so we want that part and that part. So the way I would write my answer, I would say x is less than negative one-fifth or x is greater than two-thirds. The other way to write it would be negative infinity to negative one-fifth parentheses because we are not including negative one-fifth. And then you put a u and then you would go with two-thirds comma, comma infinity. So there's your interval notation. All right, next problem. Uh, we have a, a cubic here, um, and it's not equal to zero, or it's not less than or equal to zero. So anytime you want to solve a polynomial, um, or really almost any type of equation, you want it to be equal to zero first. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to move this 12x over. So I'm going to get x cubed plus x squared minus 12x. And then I'm going to, again, pretend it's equal to zero for a minute, and then we'll deal with the inequality later. All right, so it is a cubic, but all three terms have an x attached to it. So we're going to start by factoring out our GCF, which is an X. And that gives me X squared plus X minus 12. Then this quadratic we can factor. This one's a lot easier. X plus 4, X minus 3. And so I get three possibilities. Don't forget about this X in front. That's a possibility. X equals 0. X equals negative 4. X equals positive 3. Okay, remember that your the amount of solutions you find should match your exponent. Uh, that's the fundamental theorem of algebra that you learned about back in Algebra 2. Um, so some of, sometimes they don't match exactly, but that's because maybe one of them is repeated multiple times, um, or it's possible you could get imaginary solutions, which in calculus AB, we don't deal with complex numbers, imaginary solutions, so you don't have to worry about that for calculus. Um, but that could be a possibility of why you're not seeing the same number of solutions. So it won't always match up, but that's kind of a nice rule of thumb to be thinking about. Uh, last problem, we got two solutions for quadratic. Now we got three solutions for a cubic, so it's looking good. All right, let's do our number line. All three numbers on the number line. Uh, this time we do have an equal to. So uh, we're going to use a closed circle. All right, I'm not going to write the numbers I'm picking in the regions just because that's going to make it a little cluttered. Uh, we're going to do this part in our head, and we're going to use, again, our, our factored form. It's always easier to use the factored form because you don't have to care about what the numbers are. Uh, you only have to care about what the signs are, and then you just multiply the signs together to figure it out. All right, so I'm going to use negative 5 from this region. So that give me a negative. Negative 5 plus 4 is a negative. Negative 5 minus 3 is a negative. So it's a negative times a negative times a negative. Odd number of negatives, going to give you a negative. These two would be a positive, and then a positive times another negative would be a negative. All right, negative 1. So that would be a negative. Negative 1 plus 4 is a positive. Negative 1 minus 3 is a negative. So even number of negatives is going to be a positive. Positive 1, that's going to be a positive. 1 plus 4 is a positive. 1 minus 3 is a negative. Odd number of negatives is a negative. And then positive 4 is going to be a positive and a positive, and 4 minus 3 is a positive. So that's going to be a positive. Okay, what are we looking for this time? All right, I maybe should have um, included my, my sign here. Let me go back. So when we subtracted that, this is less than or equal to 0. So this time we want the negatives, not the positives. So that's there, and that's here. So I would write that as x is less than or equal to negative 4 or 0 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 3. Negative infinity, comma, negative 4, square bracket, u, square bracket, 0 to 3, square bracket. All right, next. So this one's going to be one that could be a little weird with our pluses and minuses. You'll notice that they alternated on this as well, like I said that they normally do. So the things that can make that weird is when your factors have exponents on them, especially if it's an even exponent, because that messes up signs, because an even exponent is always positive. So just be watching out for something like that. Um, good thing about this problem is we do not have to factor. It's already in factored form. We don't have to worry about those exponents, because whatever makes the inside equal to zero is where our zeros are located. 
So um, we get x is equal to negative 3 halves and x is equal to 4. I almost said negative 4, but if you set it equal to 0, maybe I'll write this one out. 4 minus x equals 0. Then you add the x over, you get 4 is equal to x. Same thing as x is equal to 4. All right, let's put these on our number line. Negative 3 halves and 4. We're back to a less than, not equal to. So we want our open circles. All right, negative 3 halves is uh, negative 1.5. So let's go with negative 2. Okay, now we don't even need to plug it into this one because this one's squared. And what we know about squares is that they're always positive, no matter what. So I only have to worry about this one over here. So this would be 4 minus negative 2. So that'd be 4 plus 2, which is a positive. Positive times a positive is a positive. Odd exponents, you have to worry about the sign, because odd exponents, you keep the sign instead of turning it positive. All right, we'll go with 0 here. 4 minus 0 is a positive. Positive times a positive is a positive. Uh-oh, see that? The reason that happened is because at this x equals negative 3 halves point, we had a squared. And the squared kept this thing positive both times. Okay, normally normally they switch every time, right? All right, if we go to 5 out here, uh, this is going to be a positive, And then 4 minus 5 is a negative. Positive times a negative is a negative. All right, we're looking for less than 0, so we want the negative part. So x is greater than 4, or 4 parentheses to infinity. All right, a couple more, and then we're done. Hey, um, just like with graphing, anytime you see a rational function with some polynomials, you want to factor. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to write it out here to the side. These are a couple pretty easy ones to factor. x minus 4 and x minus 5 on top, and x plus 3 and x minus 3 on the bottom. All right, so we have four values that we're interested in. Um, positive 4, positive 5, negative 3, and positive 3. All four of these values have to go on our number line. So negative 3 over here, and then 3, 4, 5. OK, you have to be careful on these rational functions. It says greater than or equal to, so that means closed circles, but that only applies to the ones you get from the numerator. So the four and the five are closed circles. The two values on the denominator, if you plugged in three or negative three, you would get a zero in the denominator, which is never allowed, no matter what. It can never have a zero in the denominator. So those have to be open circles, even though the inequality says an equal to. So just keep that in mind. Denominator can never be equal to zero. Always exclude those values from your solutions. All right, so we have a lot of stuff to plug in, but again, we're using this factored form and it's gonna go quickly. So we're gonna plug in negative four. Negative four minus four is a negative. Negative four minus five is a negative. Negative four plus three is a negative. Negative four minus three is a negative. Negative times a negative, times a negative, times a negative even number of negatives is going to be a positive. This would end up being a positive divided by a positive. All right, zero. Zero minus four is a negative. Zero minus five is a negative. Zero plus three is a positive. Zero minus three is a negative. Positive over a negative is a negative. Okay, we've got to venture in decimals here, but again, we don't really care what the numbers are. We just care about the signs, so it's not as hard as it seems. 3.5. 3.5 minus 4 is a negative. 3.5 minus 5 is a negative. 3.5 plus 3 is a positive, And 3.5 minus 3 is a positive. So a positive over a positive is a positive. 4.5. 4.5 minus 4 is a positive. 4.5 minus 5 is a negative. 4.5 plus 3 is a positive, And 4.5 minus 3 is a positive. One negative makes it a negative. And last but not least is 6. 6 minus 4 is a positive. 6 minus 5 is a positive. 6 plus 3 is a positive, And 6 minus 3 is a positive. All positives. We want greater than or equal to 0, so we want all the positives. We want x is less than. Here, let me shade them in. This section here, 
this section here, this section here. So x is less than negative 3, or 3 is less than x is less than or equal to 4, or x is greater than or equal to 5. Negative infinity to negative 3, parentheses, u, parentheses 3 to 4, square bracket, u, square bracket 5 to infinity. Last one. All right, we have a cubic. This one, unlike our previous cubic, we were able to factor out an x and turn it into a quadratic. There's, we can't do that here because we have this 12. 12 doesn't have an x. So anytime you need to factor and you have four terms, you're going to do what's called factor by grouping. You're going to group the first two terms together. You're going to group the second two terms together. This method doesn't always work. They have to give you a cubic where this works. So if you do this first step, and you realize that um, it's not going to work, then you would have to change to a different strategy. That's not what we're, what we're really focused on today, so I'm not going to worry about telling you about how to do that. Uh, we'll tackle that if we ever need it later. Okay, so x squared can be factored out of this group. That would leave me with an x plus 3. And then these both have a common factor of 4. They also both have a negative, so anytime you have a negative, you want to take that out. Even if they're not both a negative, if this first one is a negative, you always want to take the negative out with it. So that's going to give me an x, and then negative 12 divided by negative 4 is positive 3. All right, and the way that you know that this worked is um, if the two things left in the parentheses are the same, that, that it has to be the same, otherwise you can't do anything else. So if those are the same, then you, you can finish it out. Um, and here's how you do that. So now you're going to think of this as a two-term thing here, which it really is. There's there's this minus sign separating the first term from the second term. All right, and these two terms have something in common. They both have an x plus 3. So just like we were able to take out an x squared from these two terms, we can take out an x plus 3 from these two terms and write it in front. And then we're going to be left over with whatever we didn't take out. So we didn't take out an x squared, that's there, and we didn't take out the minus 4, so that's there. All right, we're not quite done factoring. Uh, we have our x plus 3, and then x squared plus 4 factors again into x plus 2 and x minus 2. And we'll pretend like this is equal to 0 for a minute so we can get our three points of interest, x equals negative 3, negative 2, and positive 2. All right, let's go put those on our number line. Uh, just a regular greater than this time, so we want to do open circles on all three. All right, plug in negative four. Uh, that would be a negative times a negative times a negative, which is a negative. Negative 2.5. Kind of tricky with the negative sometimes people mess that up they put negative 1.5 or negative 3.5 they so you want negative 2.5 which would be a positive times a negative times a negative which is a positive uh, zero positive positive negative so negative and then three positive 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 so the positive uh, we want greater than zero so we want the positives which is here and here so we get negative 3 to negative 2, and then 2 to infinity. Or negative 3 is less than x is less than 2, negative 2, or x is greater than 2. All right, thanks for watching, and good luck with worksheet number one for homework.